Hello and welcome everybody. This is Mr. Lowe's. Uh, this video is going to be about the mass spectrometer and uh, I wanted to go over some more examples. I first wanted to look at this, which in the class that I did this morning, and now this is this is February 18th, 2021 as I'm recording this, um, we went over this example of propanoic acid in class, maybe a little bit quickly. So um, depending on where we got in your class or how you felt, I'm going to kind of go over it again a little bit. If you're not interested in that, feel free to skip to the next example that I do. Um, but so let's just think about the big picture here. So uh, this is from your note page, propanoic acid. One thing that's a little bit different is that um, this one includes a 45, which for some reason didn't show up on your, on your note sheet. So I do have that one added in there. But let's just kind of remind ourselves of what's going on. We are injecting some propanoic acid, and I know that just because it says it right here, um, into the mass spectrometer. We're bombarding it with electrons, and so individual molecules of um, propanoic acid might get struck by an electron. and the electron has enough energy and in the right place, it might actually cleave one of these bonds. So for example, we might um, break, the, break this thing right there. And so these two pieces then are going to go on their merry way down them. Well, I should say one of them will end up with a charge and one of them will end up uncharged typically. And so if I break it into these two pieces, maybe um, this one ends up with a plus one charge and the other one ends up neutral. And the, the only one that will be detected is the one that ends up with the plus one charge. And so eventually this will make its way down to the mass spectrometer and it might be detected. And because a CH3 has a mass of 15, um, we would detect that as a spike at 15, which we actually can see over there. Now keep in mind, there's many molecules in the mass spectrometer and they're all getting potentially cleaved in different spots. So maybe another molecule uh, gets cleaved in that same spot, except this time, the thing that ends up with a charge is this part. And potentially we could detect that. And then again, you know, hey, maybe there's another one. Maybe it gets cleaved in this spot. And the way we want to think about it, you know, we are going to think about this in a little bit of a simplified fashion. But um, we're going to think about basically one cut happening and then what are the pieces that are remaining and what are all the possibilities. So, so again, maybe it gets cut here where this green line is and then we have these pieces. And, you know, what would be the mass of these? Well, this is 29 and this is 45. And again, either one of these things could end up with a charge or end up getting detected by the mass spectrometer. Um, and so in, in this case, like what this problem is asking us to do is to figure out what piece or part is responsible for all of these different things. So uh, the biggest one is usually going to be the molecular ion, meaning the entire molecule that's just lost an electron. So if you add up the mass of this, it does add up to 74. So the peak at 74 is probably from the molecular ion. And um, so we would indicate that uh, CH3, CH2, C I'm writing it in more condensed form, but don't forget that plus sign because um, that fragment would have to have a plus, po plus one charge or it wouldn't have got detected at all in the first place. And then we have one with one less. Now what would make sense there is that a hydrogen got cleaved off. So we lost this little hydrogen guy, and that's uh, hydrogen has a mass of one, of course, so that would be one less. Now, in theory, it could be any one of these hydrogens on the carbons or anything. Probably the, car the, the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen is a weaker one, so that would be the one that would be more likely to be lost. So the more likely peak responsible, uh, 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 fragment responsible for 73 is this guy up above minus one um, hydrogen. And again, plus one. So how do we figure out, for example, what these two peaks might be here? There's a couple of ways you can do it. You could um, kind of do some different slices like I saw here and try to figure out um, what they would add up to. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it, though, is to subtract. So in other words, um, the mass... Uh, the entire mass of the, shoot, here we go. The, I just want to move this up again. I don't even know why. Um, <laughs> the, the mass of the whole thing is 74. And then there's this peak at 75. So, or rather at 59. Um, 
If I subtract the 2, I get 15. Now, the advantage of doing that is maybe 15 is something that's more familiar to you. And 15, something with a mass of 15, um, should be familiar to you. It's, in fact, one of the pieces you're required to be familiar with. That is a methyl group. A methyl group adds up to 15. So, in other words, I could think of this 59 either as some piece that is, has a mass of 59, or I could think of it as a loss of 15. So, I have my original molecule here, just like I did on the first one. And if I cleave off the CH3, the, the, the 59 would be what's left over. And I don't even have to add it up. I mean, you can to double check. This does add up to 59. But by subtraction, I'm noticing, oh, this is just the original thing minus a CH3. And it just happens to be the case that in this trip through the mass spectrometer, there were some molecules where um, this, this one on this side was the part they got the positive charge, and the CH3 remained undetected. I can do a similar thing with the 57. I could subtract those two, and I get 17. And again, these are just these are just like smaller numbers. Those are smaller pieces, which are automatically going to be easier to find and to see because there's going to be less possibilities, right? And a 59, uh, rather a 17, that's real nicely what a um, OH group is. So that's a loss of an OH group. So the 17 is everything but the OH group. So I'm, I'm um, cutting it right here. And again, this part here was the part that's detected. And by subtracting and saying loss of 17, oh, okay, I lost that part. The rest of it would add up to 57. And so that's what I have here. The, the 59 is with one less methyl group, so I you know, kind of chop it off right there. The 57 um, uh, lost the OH on the end. Um, a 29, that is another one that the IB wants you to be specifically familiar with. One thing that can generate a 29 is a little ethyl group, a CH2CH3. And uh, so if I cut that right there, so an ethyl group... CH2, CH3, and again, when we're saying what fragment is, is responsible, make sure you indicate a plus sign because if it wasn't positive, it wouldn't have that. And then the 15 and the 17, we've kind of already seen. The, 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 oh, oh, I skipped the 45, but um, the, the 17 is an OH. And notice that's formed in small quantities. That, that's actually not a very common fragment to form. And then the 15 um, is the methyl group. So... We have those. So not, like I was saying before, um, when we make the cleave like this top one, if, if the CH3 happens to get the positive charge, that's going to be detected. If the 59 part gets the positive charge, that's the one that's going to be detected. And when you send many molecules through, one or the other of those things might happen any number of times. Um, the 45, which I skipped, that's another one that you should know. One thing that can generate a 45 is a, is a carboxylic acid group, which of course makes perfect sense given that this is uh, propanoic acid. So the, the, the 45, which is not on your note sheet, and I also didn't write here, um, would be a COOH plus. So that is propanoic acid. One thing I wanted to show you is, is this is a very, very simplified view of the mass spectrometer and, uh, or the mass spec, like the readout that you would get for propanoic acid. A real one might look much more like this, definitely quite a bit more complicated. Same sort of thing is done in the analysis of figuring out what this is. And one, once you have a, a reading for propanoic acid, um, the next time you put propanoic acid in there, it's going to look exactly the same. So it, once you have one established, it can become like a fingerprint and very easily used to identify propanoic acid. Um, so yeah, there's just some more complexities. There's all, there's all kinds of different things that can happen inside the mass spectrometer. One thing I think is in, at least worth noting on this is we, we're actually getting a little tiny peak at 75. And how we might get that is what if one of these carbons is carbon 13 instead of carbon 12? Um, carbon 12 is by far the most common, but you could have a carbon 13 in there that would um, bump the mass up by one. So that's just one example of some of the little bits of complexity that can that can cause all these different lines right here. So uh, now I want to, this one actually, let's skip this one and, oh, spoiler alert, um, let's do uh, this one. So this is actually the third one. Um, 
So let's take a look at that. So we have uh, two mass spec readouts here, and we have A and B, and it says um, which is methyl methanoate and which is ethanoic acid. So um, one is A and one is B. So the first task would be to actually write them out and see um, what they both look like. Hopefully we still remember our naming. But methyl methanoate is the ester form from um, methanol and methanoic acid, which would look like this. And then ethanoic acid is that one. Now they have the same molar mass. So unfortunately, if they have different molar masses, it would be easy. We could just look at this top mass, which is usually the molecular ion. But they are isomers, so they have the structural isomers, so they have the same mass. Um, well, how could we do this? Let's just kind of start thinking maybe about some different pieces that might form in the mass spectrometer. So I'll make a copy of this and we could start like pondering some things. So um, I could maybe, um, we could have a cleaving that would happen right there. And what would that lead to? That would lead to pieces that are 15 would be that mass. And then um, the entire mass is 60, 60 minus 15 is 45. So I could either figure out that mass by subtraction or by just adding up the individual pieces and parts. Um, let's see, what else could happen? We could have a, um, another one of those and um, maybe we do something uh, right here. And that would be, so CH3, carbon is 12, 13, 14, 15, plus 16, that would be 31. And then the remainder would be uh, the rest of it, which would be 29. These Remember, these have to sum to 60, or of course, you just add it up. Um, and so already, when we're, when we're doing what we've done so far, uh, the top one is looking pretty good for the uh, uh, methyl methanoate A. Um, because notice we're seeing all those fragments that I just mentioned here. But let's do the due diligence here and kind of work through um, ethanoic acid and see what might make sense there. Um, okay, well, we could have a cleaving right here, which this piece over here has a mass of 15, and then that would be 60 minus 15, which is 45. Um, that's not super helpful because that's actually the the piece that we um, already saw. Those are the same mass pieces that we saw in the other example. Um, what else might we have here? We have, I'll just draw it again, CH3COOH. Um, we could have this guy that's lost right here. That would have a mass of 17, and then the remainder of it would be 60 minus 17, which is 43. So that is matching up with some of the things that we're seeing here. Um, now, we are not seeing a 17. So 17 is actually pretty unlikely to form as a plus one ion. Um, it, it tends to not be detected by the mass spectrometer, so we're not seeing any peaks at 17, but that's not necessarily super surprising. And we got this little 28. Um, now, typically, we're going to make one cut here, but it, it, for example, maybe that's a carbonyl that's showing up there. Um, so, you know, maybe it gets cut twice, a carbonyl is showing up in there. Um, who knows? But I think based on the information that we've gathered, it seems it must be the case that uh, A is the, methyl, is the methyl methanoate and B is the ethanoic acid. And some of the best pieces of evidence for that probably are this 31 piece right here. Um, you can't really get a 31 piece from the methanoic acid, from the um, ethanoic acid. Uh, we, there's no CH3O thingy that we can cut. There's no cut that we can make here that's going to give us that CH3O. Um, the 45, uh, 45 is not super helpful because they both have a 45, but I think the 31 is one of our best um, pieces of evidence that the top one is the one that uh, is the methyl methanoic. The 31 and the 29 both are not pieces that we're going to see with the ethanoic acid. Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is this one, which is the middle uh, one on your sheet that I skipped over. It says on your sheet that this is a halogenoalkane, and we are to determine the actual structure of it. Um, so a hint on that is one of the fragments is actually from the halogen itself. Keeping in mind, um, we may be seeing some isotopes uh, here of the halogen. So you could figure out what the halogen is, and then from there, Maybe figure out how many carbons are in it. Um, so it's a little bit of a hint. So 
pause it for a second, uh, see if you can make any headway based on just that. If you're completely stuck, I'll give you another hint. So pause the video for a moment. So this halogen does appear to be bromine because of the, iso the uh, 79 and 81 that we see that represents the two isotopes of bromine, and it really only makes sense that that would be bromine. And so the average atomic mass is roughly right in the middle of those, like uh, I think it's like 79.9 or something if I remember right because they're pretty evenly distributed. So from there, thinking about the mass that's left over from the um, molecular ions here, it turns out there needs to be three carbons. And the reason we're seeing 122 and 24 is – um, we could have these structures, if you build this structure with the 81 isotope of bromine, it would have a mass of 124. If you build it with the 79, it's going to have a mass of 122. And there are only two isomers, and those are the two. So from there, knowing that much, if you got stuck before, see if you can figure out uh, which one of these structures actually this is. And go ahead and uh, pause the video if you didn't figure it out the first time. So in thinking about the pieces that we can get from each one, so again, we see the 122 and 124. Those are just the molecular ions. The 79 and the 81 is just if we slice off and just get a bromine. So then we have this 43 and the 29. Well, let's think about the 43 first. Um, if we did the slice that I just did right here, this would add up to 43. So a CH3, CH2, CH2 thingy is a 43. But that's not really helpful because if we slice this guy right here, this piece down here is also 43. So that doesn't tell us much. But the one that is helpful here is this 29. Because what a 29 is, is a CH3, CH2. So if we slice the top one right here, um, that gives us the 29 piece. There is no single slice I can do to the bottom one to give myself a CH3, CH2. Um, I could do this maybe, um, but that's that's CH three CH. That would actually be twenty eight. Uh, well, I, actually, never mind. It'd be tw we'd put, have the bromine in it, so twenty eight plus the bromine. So, um, but there is no CH three CH two we can make here in a in a single slice. So, looks to be that this uh, top structure is the correct one. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is uh, this is the next page in your notes. The degree of unsaturation. Um, or the index of hydrogen deficiency, IHD. And basically what this number is, it's a value of how many H2s, how many H2s would it take to take an unsaturated thing to a saturated thing? Remember, unsaturated means um, fewer hydrogens than the maximum if it was like a straight chain thing. So for example, alkenes are unsaturated. They're going to have two fewer hydrogens than, than the saturated version. But even rings are unsaturated because... When you link hydrogens together in a ring, you actually lose two potential hydrogens. So like um, this is if this was cyclohexane, um, that would be C6H12, whereas actual straight chain hexane is C6H14. So even a ring is considered unsaturated in this context. So a couple examples, anything with a single car with a carbon carbon double bond in there somewhere, just one carbon carbon double bond is going to have an IHD of one. So for example, propene, um, which would be like so, so CH2, CH, CH3, to change that to propane, I would need one CH2 molecule. Uh, I mean rather one H2 molecule. So Propene is two hydrogens short, so it would take one H2. So again, the, the IHD is, is not the number of hydrogens. It needs two more hydrogens, but it needs one H2, and that's what the IHD is. How many H2 molecules does it need? Um, if something has a triple bond like ethyne here, which would be that, so we're going to try to turn ethyne into ethane, which would be C2H6. Um, that would take two hydrogens because I got a total of two hydrogens so far. I would need to add a total of four more, which would be two H2s and the IHD of two. Um, a ringed structure is going to have an IHD of one. So cyclo, cyclopentane um, would basically be CH2, 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 one, two, three. CH2, CH2, 
uh, like that. Sorry, horrible drawing, but C5H10 is what that is, and we're going to turn it to C5H12, which would be 1H2. So it's, it's the number of H2 molecules that it takes to saturate it. Um, an aromatic ring like benzene is going to have an IHD of 4. So benzene, which you know has the delocalized pi bond and all that good stuff, but uh, benzene is C6H6. There's one hydrogen H1 of these spots. We're trying to turn that to hexane, which would be C6H14. That means I would need four hydrogen H2 molecules to completely saturate that. So one thing that we're going to be asked to do is to determine the index of hydrogen deficiency of various things. Um, and basically, you can do it one of two ways. You can look at the formula and just kind of try to deduce it or figure it out. Or you can use this little thingy right here, this little formula. Now, unfortunately, the formula is not given to you. So if you like that formula, you're going to have to memorize it. Um, I would advise you in most cases to try to figure out a way not to use that formula, or at least that's the way my brain works. You know, I don't like memorizing formulas, but um, <clears throat> that's one of the two ways that you're going to have to do it. So two times the number of carbons plus two minus the number of hydrogens minus X, which would be a halogen and minus nitrogen. Um, notice that oxygen doesn't show up here anywhere, and that's because oxygens don't change. Like, for example, ethanol there has the same number of hydrogens that uh, it, it doesn't affect the number of hydrogens in the sense of so that's that's ethanol compared to ethane let's say both of them have six hydrogens so the oxygen doesn't like affect the number of hydrogens that you would expect um, if the thing was saturated and like didn't have an oxygen in it so oxygen doesn't show up in there at all rely on a fair bit in this context is the, something we talked about last when we were first talking about organic which is the generic formula for an alkane or a saturated alkane is going to be CnH2n plus 2 in other words however many if, for example C6 if it's going to be saturated the number of hydrogens would be 2 times 6 is 12 plus another 2 is 14 um, and that's one way you can tell if something is saturated or not, and that, that can get us a long way towards finding the IHD of something as opposed to trying to do this formula. So, for example, um, on this top one here, uh, I personally would not use the formula for this one. I would just do the 2N plus 2 thing. So, CNH2N plus 2. So, something with 10 carbons... So the number of carbons is 10, so that would be 10 times 2 is 20 plus 2. That means I should have 22 hydrogens if this thing is saturated. The compound has 18, so therefore I'm short 4 hydrogens, and therefore that would be an IHD of 2. Uh, because remember hydrogen is diatomic. I would need two H2s to get to those four additional hydrogens so the IHD for that one is two. Now if you were to use the formula um, up here, so two, you're basically doing the same thing. Two uh, times the number of carbons which is 10 um, minus the number of hydrogens which is 18 and then uh, the whole rest of it doesn't matter because we don't have anything else. So 20 um, uh, whoops, forgot the plus 2 part in here. So 20 plus 2 is 22, minus 18 is 4, divided by 2. So it, it still is 2, even if we use the formula. Um, the second one, C6H6O. So again, a couple of ways to figure this out. Um, remembering that oxygens do not affect the, um, the IHD, we could still do the 2N plus 2 thing. So if we got 6 uh, times 2 is 12, plus another 2 is 14. So the saturated version of this would have 14. Um, this version has 6. So 14 minus 6 is 8. Uh, that is 8 additional hydrogens are needed, but hydrogen is diatomic, so that molecule would have an IHD of 4. Um, this one, okay, so we could try we could try the formula for that one. So we got to go 2 times the number of carbons, which is 5, 
plus 2 up there, and then we subtract the number of hydrogens, which is 11, and then we uh, minus the number of halogens, so x is a halogen, so that's minus 1, and then all of that gets divided by 2. So, two, uh, 10 plus 2 is 12, um, minus 11 is 1, minus 1 is 0, so that means this bad boy is in fact already saturated, and so the IHD is 0, because we got 0 there. Um, and then we could do this bottom one. We could, well, actually, let me show you another approach that you could take instead of doing the formula. Draw out the thing. Okay, so I got five carbons. Two, three, four, five. Draw out everything is there. Assume it's kind of like primary connections and all of that. And so I'm going to put that CL on there and just chuck in hydrogens you know, like where they should be. So basically what I'm drawing is, what would the saturated version of this thing be that has hydrogens in every possible spot? So if I draw that out and I count my hydrogens, I do have one, I do have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So I have confirmed that it is in fact, um, saturated and the IHD is zero. If I was going to take that approach for B, so B says C6H6O. So again, let's draw it pretending that it is saturated. So we would have four, uh, six carbons rather, one, two, three, four, five, six, and there would be hydrogens, oh, and then we have the O, okay? There would have to be hydrogens everywhere here, including here attached to the oxygen. Remember saturated, we're saying like there's no double bonds or anything anywhere. So how many uh, hydrogens would that be? It would be um, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 hydrogens is what it should have. The compound says it has six, that's eight, and then it needs to be diatomic, so we divide it by two and we come up with four. So that's another way you could do this without having to actually memorize that formula is would be to sketch out like the straight chain version. Um, okay, one more here. This uh, Zenomavir C12H20N4. Um, so if we were going to do the formula, it would be two times the number of carbons, which is 12 plus two minus the number of hydrogens, which is 20. And then with uh, nitrogens, you're going to add in the number of nitrogens. So that's plus 4 and all that divided by 2. So 12 plus 2 is 14 plus 2 is um, 16 minus 20 is negative 4. And then uh, plus 4 is 0. So this thing also would have an IHD of 0. Uh, never mind. Sorry, I screwed that up royally. Uh, two, it would be, I forgot the two. So it's 24 plus two minus 20. That's, that ends up, um, that ends up being 10 on the top divided by two. So our IHD is five there.